Everybody's asking about the trip. How'd we do on the trip? Yes, we walked a lot. We walked. My wife is impressive because uh, she kept up better than, probably better than I did, but um, should have seen her in the airport yesterday morning. She was a beast. She was like running up the escalator. She wanted to get home so bad. <laughs> she was not going to miss that flight. But uh, we're home and it was good. Let me, for those of you that aren't on Facebook and uh, don't know, but we had the opportunity to travel to uh, Greece and Turkey and Italy the last couple of weeks. It's the footsteps of Paul, the churches that he not necessarily started, but he was involved with and wrote letters to. And uh, throw that, can you throw that map up there of, I'll show you where, this is where all we went in two weeks. Yeah. <laughs> You're talking about like moving almost every night. I think there was, we did take a three night cruise to get to the islands and stuff like that. But we, during the day, we literally hit two islands a day. Like you would get off in the morning, walk the island and then get back on the boat, do lunch. And then you'd get back off the boat and do dinner on the island and stuff like that. But let me just kind of point out to you where we were. We flew into uh, Istanbul the first night from Atlanta and then jumped over to Thessaloniki. We got another flight. It is Thessaloniki. It, <laughs> she, she is the goddess of victory, which is where Nike came from. And there's actually this stone picture of her. And in her dress, there's an actual swoosh mark, which is where Nike got it. So uh, so we started out in Thessaloniki, and then the first day we went over, this Thessaloniki right here, and then we went over to Philippi where uh, Paul, his first Gentile convert in Europe was Lydia, and we saw the water that Lydia was baptizing. I'm not going to go through the whole thing right now, but uh, as we go. And then we went back to Thessaloniki for the night. Then we came down to meet Aurora, which is just like, uh, just this beautiful place with these stone stone figments that came out of the ground and they've built monasteries on top of them. And it's just, if you saw some of the pictures of us up in the clouds, that was where we were. We came down to Athens. Athens is right here at the inn. Uh, we did go by the, the Spartans, where the 300 Spartans were, uh, just for those of you that are like the, that movie. But uh, the Acropolis... Uh, everybody's asking me what was my favorite part of the trip. We went with 48 total people in this group that was from all over the country. It was with uh, Life Action Ministry out of Mich Michigan. And they don't necessarily teach the same thing that we teach here. Uh, they teach the Bible, obviously, but uh, identity and grace and things like that. And so the things that, that struck them emotionally and spiritually didn't necessarily strike Michelle and I. Uh, such as the Bema seat in uh, Corinth. Uh, the Bema seat is a place of judgment that every city has a Bema seat. And sometimes they go and they speak from the Bema seat. So Paul would teach from the Bema seat, but it's typically where judgment took place. And so it was a big deal about the judgment, the final judgment. To me, that's going to be a glorious day because uh, he's already taken care of all my sin and, uh, it's just based upon my works that I do in, in him, through him. It's really all that matters. Uh, but if you were to ask me what was the most, the thing that stood out for me was probably Mars Hill. In Athens, you have the Acropolis, which is at the top of the hill. And then at the bottom of the hill uh, is this just gigantic rock that you can climb on. And we did. And that's where all the philosophers in Athens and Greece would go and they would just debate one another and Paul sat down and had this conversation with them about Jesus. That's where he and, and the philosophers, some of them came to know Jesus at that point. But to be able to stand there, knowing that Paul, this is where Paul stood and talked about Jesus, uh, you know, I, the, the, I think the hardest part for me is it's watching people like worship these places and these icons and these statues and 
it's like that that's not what it's about i mean it's cool to be there it's cool to see things and the reality of it all i know where thessaloniki is now and corinth and crete and all these different places being there but uh watching the idolatry of it all, especially when we got to Rome and the Vatican, oh my goodness. Uh, I would say uh, to just being there, knowing that this is where the gospel began to take place was, was it for me. That was it. Just knowing that uh, we walked where Paul walked, that road, that road from the boot of Italy all the way up to Rome, he walked. To his to his death, um, we went. We got in Athens. We got on a boat. We went over to Ephesus. Ephesus uh, is probably the biggest biggest excavational dig that I've seen ever in my life. It was uh, at least a mile long of just uh, three story buildings that they've excavated, libraries and stuff like that. Uh, and to know that the people of Ephesus were one of the first churches around just is amazing. Uh, we got on a boat, went to Mykonos Island. Uh, we came down to Patmos where John uh, was exiled for a couple of years. Uh, we came down to Crete. And then we went back to Athens and we went over to Corinth. This is Corinth right here and went back to Athens. And then we flew to Rome, Italy, where we spent the last couple of days just cruising around and seeing things. To me, the most impressive sight was the Roman Colosseum. Just seeing that thing you see in the movies all the time, Gladiator and stuff, but uh, it was pretty amazing. But uh, we got home yesterday morning. We're a little tired, but it's all good. Uh, now I'm going to move from that. Because I'll, I'll, I'll share, I shared pictures on Facebook uh, with you, and uh, I'll share more as we continue to teach throughout the Scripture but I'm going to start where I said we would, which is in Genesis. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. It says, in the beginning... Let's stop there. Was there ever a beginning? If, if God is eternity past and eternity future, was there ever a beginning? Not, not with God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They've always existed. They've always been around. The three. And we know, based upon what John says, that God is love. God is love. And so, it is natural for God to create because he loves and he loves us. That's why you were created, because God loves you. And so when it talks about in the beginning, it's really talking about the beginning of creation because they've always existed. Now, if you wanted to get into technical beginnings and creation and everything else. I know there's people in the room here that will go, uh, what about the angels? When were the angels created? Which in Scripture they can be referred to as sons of God. Uh, sons of God in the Old Testament, sons of God in the New Testament would be you, that you're children of God. But I go back to uh, Job chapter 38 says this, Where were you when I established the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who fixed its dimensions? Certainly you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? What supports its foundations or who laid its cornerstone while the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? So if all the sons of God shouted for joy before creation, they possibly existed. This isn't a study about angels. This is a study about creation. But here's what you need to know. In John chapter 1, who the Creator is, the Creator of all things, it says, In the beginning was the Word, capital W. 
And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things created through Him, and apart from Him, not one thing was created that has been created. And you jump down to John 1.14, and here, here's what the answer is. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Who is the Word? Jesus. Who is the Creator of all things? Jesus. We observed His glory, the glory as the one and only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. When you look at Colossians chapter 1, verse 16, it says, For everything was created by Him, talking about Jesus in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, could be the sons of God, the angels. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, the things that we're praying for, the authorities that we're praying for, all things have been created through Him and for Him. He is before all things, and by Him all things hold together. We live in a world where this story about creation is deeply challenged. Our kids, our kids, you, you were deeply challenged in school about the creation. The older I get, and the more I see, and the more I experience, puts that whole evolution thing to change, to just, to, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. The Big Bang Theory does not make sense to me. God makes sense to me. I, I am so complex. I'm talking about my physical body. My physical body is so complex. It didn't just happen. It didn't just happen. There is a creator. And he did create all things. And then you get into the whole discussion of whether it was an old world or new world. How long was creation? How did, how did the Grand Canyon get formed? And by rivers over thousands and thousands, or God could have just created it. <laughs> he is God. He said, says in the scripture, and uh, Moses is the one that we believe is the author of the first five books, the Pentateuch, which is what we're reading. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty, Darkness covered the surface of the watery depths, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. This is what it looked like. He was present, and this is what it looked like. Like, when Luke and I were teaching this to high school students, I, I got to teach this story, and I, I tried, to, tried to get them to remember remember about the creation. I don't know if they still do. Ethan, I'm not going to call you out and see if you know, but uh, I fed them. I fed them every day. Like I fed them that night each day of the creation. I'll tell you about that at the end. Uh, but I want, you to, I want you to grasp this. I'd love for you to walk away from here today and go, yeah, I know what all seven days were. So let me try to help you. The earth was formless and empty. Darkness covered the surface of the watery depths, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Verse 3. Then God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. Light is good. It allows us to see. The older I get, the more light I need. The older I get, the more I realize the light that I am. I'm not saying that as an arrogant thing. It's just knowing what I have. 
that I have the creator of all things inside of me. And if I have the creator of all things inside of me, I can be a light to this darkness of the world. It's not my responsibility. responsibility. It's not my duty. I heard that for the last couple of weeks. <laughs> it's not. It's just something natural, natural that happens. To be able to talk about Jesus, to be able to talk about creation. There was light. God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. So the first day, the first day, God called the light day and the darkness He called night. There was an evening and there was a morning. One day. One day. Remember this. One flashlight. <laughs> Alright? First day God created light. You realize that how strong, there was no way I could make it completely dark in here. There's no way. I mean, just the, the tiny light from your phones that are lit up right now would, would run the darkness out of this room. It's what light does. Uh, as we went to Rome, I, I think the only thing that was, besides the Colosseum, that was fascinating to me is we did go into Vatican City. <laughs> This is the way my mind thinks. Cost cost us twenty five dollars just to walk into Vatican City. Forty thousand people a day. That's one point one million dollars a day they get. It's insane. That's just entrance fee. All the stuff they sell inside. But uh, in in when you walk into the Vatican, one of the the places that you get to go into is the Sistine Chapel. And you can't take pictures. No, they're very strict about that. I don't know why, because, I don't know. but the Sistine Chapel was absolutely amazing to me. Like you, you see the pictures, and I can show you pictures here this morning. Uh, but seeing it, it was, it was far greater than I ever imagined. Just the stories of I, 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 Michelangelo did it in the 1500s, you know, and he built a scaffolding and it was on his back and painted these nine or ten panels on the ceiling. Um, this first panel here was when God brought light into the world. Don't expect me to interpret that for him. <laughs> I'm not sure. What, and we saw so many naked people. It was just like... <laughs> it's like, <laughs> it was like everywhere you go, it was like... Uh, but he believed that because of God, cre God created Adam and Eve naked, that it was important to display the, the beauty of his creation. So he, he actually painted almost everybody in the Sistine Chapel naked. And then, I think it was like in the 1700s, they actually, the other pope came in, and he's like, there's too many naked people in here. This is a, this is a true story. And they hired some other painter to come in and paint clothes on some of the, not all of them, but some of them. And they actually called this painter Mr. Underpants. <laughs> it's a true story, at least from my tour guide. Verse 6, then God said, let there be an expanse between the water separating water from water. So God made the expanse and separated the water under the expanse from the water above the expanse. And it was so. God called the expanse sky. Evening came, then morning the second day. This is what it looked like. So if the earth is formless and void, we know that it was basically just covered with water. And so then God created the sky, which is in the middle here, and you had water on the earth, covering the earth, and then you had a canopy of water above. You know, it never rained until Noah. So there was this, people go, well, 
how did they live so long? How did they get to be so old? Well, they didn't have the ultraviolet rays beaming down on them because of this canopy of water that was above them. And it didn't rain and empty out. Not that it's ever empty, but uh, he made a sky. There's water above and there's water below. Are you hearing this for the first time? And then, so there, there's on day two, on day two, there's two waters. Water below, water above. Day one was what? One flashlight. One flashlight, two waters. You with me? Verse 9, it says, Then God said, Let the water under the sky be generated into, gathered into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth. And the gathering of the water he called seas, and God saw that it was good. This is what it looked like. You have the continents, and you have the oceans, and the seas, and you have land. This is the third, no, this is not the third, it's still part of the third day, but it continues. Watch this. Verse 11, it says, Then God said, Let the earth produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants, and fruit trees on the earth bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And it was so. The earth produced vegetation, seed-bearing plants according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds, and God saw that it was good. Evening came, then morning, the third day. The third day. So now you have vegetation. You have trees, and man, we ate good over there. Uh, we didn't eat a lot of meat, but we ate a lot of fruits and vegetables and carbs, a lot of carbs. They love their bread over there and pizza and everything else. But uh, it's so, it's so, the Mediter- it's Mediterranean food. It's good food. So you have this to remember now. You have three trees. We always had like three juices in the morning, so that's what they are. It's the apple tree, the orange tree, and the cherry tree. I had cherry juice, and it was really good. So you got one flashlight, two waters, three trees. You with me? Day three. Verse 14, it says, Then God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate the day from the night. They will serve as signs for seasons and for days and years. There will be lights in the expanse of the sky to provide light on the earth. And it was so. You can't forget the eclipse, right? How amazing that was to know that important light is. (laughs) Did you get to experience when the eclipse happened and it was like totally dark here in Fishers that the insects and everything else began to like, I mean, it was like nighttime for like three minutes. It says, uh, they will be lights in the expanse of the sky to provide light on the earth, and it was so. God made two great lights. The greater light to rule over the day and the lesser lights to rule over the night, as well as the stars. God placed them in the expanse of the sky to provide light on earth, to rule the day and the night, and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good. Evening came, and then morning, the fourth day. This is what you're going to remember. There's a sun, and a moon, and a couple of stars. There's four. Day four. One battery, two waters, three trees, four Sun, moon, and stars. Verse 20. Then God said, Let the water swarm with living creatures, and let the birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the sky. So God created the large sea creatures and every living creature that moves and swarms in the water according to their kinds. He also created every winged creature according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. God bless them. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters of the seas and let the birds multiply on the earth. Evening came and in the morning, the fifth day. You know how hard it was to find five (laughs) birds and fish? 
it gets better when we get to Adam and Eve. <laughs> so he created all the birds and all the fish. No livestock yet, no animals yet, no humans yet. One battery, one flashlight, two waters, three trees, four what? Sun, moon, stars, and then five birds and fish. Day five. You know that you're going to be biblical, intellectual people more than other Christians when you walk out of here today. <laughs> that you can actually like know the seven days of creation. Then God said, let the earth produce living creatures according to their kinds, livestock, creatures that crawl, and the wildlife of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. So God made the wildlife of the earth according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and the creatures that crawl on the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Who's our? God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Has anybody ever seen God? He says, According to our likeness, they will rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, the whole earth, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. So God created man in his own image. And he created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. So in Genesis chapter 1, he says that he created both male and female. When we get to Genesis chapter 2, he gets more description about creating Adam and Eve. Some people will say, well, Adam and Eve weren't the, necessarily the first people because in chapter 1 he talks about creating... Uh, like, uh. So if he created us in his image, what does that mean? God looks like me? I don't think so. He, he gave me a personality. He gave me a personality. And my personality is different than any of yours. And your personality is different than anyone else. But he also gave us minds to think. He gave us emotions to feel with. And wills for making decisions. But he also gave us this inner spiritual nature that enables us to know Him and to worship Him. Like, when He created us in His image, He gave us the ability to communicate with Him. I mean, what, what, what was the purpose of being created? He loves us so we can love Him in, in return. When we're created in His image, to be with God, the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He created them perfectly. They were perfect. No sin. Like that, that relationship, which, which we will have eventually, we will have eventually again. All right now I'm in this flesh and but he created them perfectly. It says this, God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and every creature that crawls on the earth. God also said, look, I have given you every seed-bearing plant on the surface of the entire earth and every tree whose fruit contains seed. This will be food for you. For all the wildlife of the earth, for every bird of the sky and every creature that crawls on earth, everything having the breath of life in it, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made and it was very good indeed. Evening came, then morning, the sixth day. <laughs> now, trying to find an appropriate Adam and Eve picture. <laughs> they had to be naked. They had to be naked, so there's this one, and then you got the kids' version next. <laughs> but this third one really intrigued me. <laughs> <It's>, 
Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, take that down. <laughs> the Sistine Chapel. This was Michelangelo's interpretation of God creating Adam. That at the touch of the fingers that he breathed life into man. He breathed life into man. And he allowed him to rule over the world. The wildlife, fish, the birds, everything. God said, this is yours. Created this for you. And then we get into chapter 2, just a couple of verses. So day 6 is humans and wildlife. So the heavens and the earth and everything in them were completed. It was done. Creation was done. And on the seventh day, God had completed his work that he had done and rested on the seventh day from all of his work that he had done. Verse 3, God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy, for on it he rested from all his work of creation. I don't think it's hard for you to remember day 7. Day 7, we know that God rested, and that's when Sunday came along and before you youngins were playing baseball tournaments and everything else, we didn't do anything on Sunday. Malls weren't open. Movie theaters weren't open. You didn't, you didn't do anything on Sunday. You went to church and that was it. Remember those days? Now Sunday is just another day. I, I think it's interesting, too, uh, what we teach in here and what is probably taught in the most churches is different. That the Sabbath day is a day of physical rest. And there, it, it was intended to be so much greater than that. Like literally, people believe that uh, we're supposed to just chill out on the seventh day, that we're supposed to rest because that's what God did. He created everything in six days and then he's, he's resting. But he knew that there was a Sabbath rest that was to come. And that Sabbath rest is this. That Trinity, God the Father, Jesus the Son, the Holy Spirit, died on the cross, was buried, rose again, sits at the right hand, and they sent the Spirit to live inside of us. And so now this Trinity lives inside of me. And I have two choices. I can either do everything in my own strength or I can allow him to do everything through me. I pray that he's teaching through me this morning. I pray that it's not my flesh. And when he's working through me and doing things for me, even breathing for me, that's Sabbath rest. Every minute, every day, 24-7. Not just Sunday. Like, I'm learning to live my life by another source. Sometimes I fail. Sometimes I take the reins. Sometimes I, my flesh rises up. But here's the last thought I'd leave with you on this. Well, I, don't, I don't know about this, but I process it. It's like, I think in six days, God just spun everything into motion. Like he, he set it up. He gave us free will. He gave free will to Adam and Eve, you know, make choices. He doesn't, I, I don't believe that he predestines people to love him and to not love him. That doesn't even make sense to me. Uh, but he gave them free will and he knew today the decisions that I was going to make today, back then. Right? He knew. Like, he's already died and take care of my sin and everything else on the cross. It's not like he has to come back and do it again. But So he's, he set everything into motion. And if that's the case, then I, I believe that God is still resting. Yet he's still very active. He doesn't sleep or slumber, but he's resting, but he's put everything in motion. Now we call that a religious word of sovereignty. The God, it's God's sovereignty. I don't know how it plays out. That's the, if you, if, 
if you want to get into a theological discussion, I'm just going to say you win because I don't understand God's sovereignty. I don't. I don't understand why, why Logan's hip is broken. Why Logan's had to like suffer it that she's had to suffer through her life. I, and I look at you and think about the things that you're experiencing and the loss that you're experiencing. I don't know. I don't have an answer. But I do know that God is a good God. And He created you because He loves you. And that whole free will thing, allowing us to choose to love Him, kind of messed some things up. He's still, He's resting, but He's active. He's resting, but He knows. He knows what's going to happen down the road. He knows. He's got it. Trust him, trust him. The seven days of creation. One flashlight, two waters, three trees, four sun, moon, and stars, five fish and birds, six humans and wildlife, seven, God rested. <laughs> And that's the end of the message. <laughs> it's time to go. Jesus, thank you for today. Just thank you for uh, your creation, your holiness, that you reside in us. And I trust you. I trust you uh, that your word is true, that it's true, that you created all of this and you created us because you loved us and uh, couldn't be any better than it is right now because you reside in us. You breathe for us. You sing for us. You walk with us through our difficulties. You love us dearly. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.